Robinson, Interim Director of Events and Conference Services here at Scripps College, and I'm delighted to see all of you here tonight. I'd like to start off by respectfully acknowledging that Scripps College sits within the historic homeland of the Tongva people. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and colonization in our area. We acknowledge the strength and resilience of the Tongva people of the past, present, and future as the original caretakers of the land, water, and air, and we recognize our responsibility to be respectful stewards of the Scripps College campus. Today, this area and this campus are home to many indigenous people from across the globe, and we are proud that they are part of our community and our institution. So, now a little bit about Scripps Presents programming series. We offer a robust slate of stand-up comedy and conversations, as well as panels, performances, and films from a diverse group of actors, writers, scholars, activists, and producers. And tonight, we are pleased to be featuring the documentary, Gabby Giffords Won't Back Down. Yeah. <laughs> The film will be followed by a panel discussion with Gabby Giffords herself, Lisa Erspamer, the film's producer, and Peter Ambler, executive director of the Giffords organization. They will be introduced after the film by our amazing divisional leader, Vinci Harvey, vice president of external relations and institutional engagement. So for now, please sit back, relax, and enjoy the riveting screening of Gabby Gibbard's Won't Back Down. Thank you. It is my honor to introduce Gabrielle Giffords, a leader whose integrity, tenacity, and conviction sets an unparalleled standard for dedication to public service and the public good. Ms. Giffords was, Ms. Giffords was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives representing Arizona from 2005 to 2012, where she established a reputation for consensus-building leadership and resilience in the face of violence. The inspiring and moving documentary, Gabby Giffords Won't Back Down, tells the extraordinary story of her relentless fight to recover following an assassination attempt in 2011, and her emergence as one of the world's most effective activists against gun violence. She currently leads Giffords' Courage to Fight Gun Violence, the gun violence prevention nonprofit organization that she co-founded. Gabby, as she is affectionately known, is a proud Scripps alum <laughs> from the class of 1993, and she pursued here a dual major in Latin American Studies and Sociology. In 2013, Gabby was awarded the college's highest level of recognition, the Ellen Browning Scripps Medal, for her embodiment of the college's motto, confidence, courage, and hope. Scripps was honored to have Gabby deliver the 2009 commencement address where she emphasized the importance of public service and integrity. And she said, standing up for one's own integrity makes you no friends, yet defiance of the mob in service of what is right is one of the highest expressions of courage I know. Please join me in celebrating Gabrielle Gibson.
Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Woo! Can we give it up just one more time for those three just <laughs> Washington, D.C. office as a legislative director 12 years ago when we got the terrible news that she had been shot in the head at that Tucson supermarket. Um, I've worked um, at her shoulder for most of the past 12 years, and I can tell you that not a day goes by where that, um, that courage, that grit, that determination, and that inspiration doesn't um, come through. And I wake up every day just a little bit more excited to get to work saving lives from gun violence because of her amazing leadership. So thank you so much, Gabby. Yeah. Um, but I, it's a little weird to do after the documentary, but do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm from Tucson, Arizona. I'm January 8th, 2011, changed my life forever. I was a congresswoman. I was shot in my head while meeting with my constituents. I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I watched gun violence destroy too many lives. After the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, I said, enough is enough. I founded the We are on a mission to end gun violence now. Uh, Lisa Erspommer, the yes. producer of the film. You saw her name, but not her face. Uh, Classroom Cross this film. So you've been a longtime executive uh, producer of a little show called Oprah. You launched her network. You produced the Whitney documentary, and now, of course, Gabby Giffords won't back down. Can you tell us a little bit about why it's important to lift up the powerful voices of women to, and to tell their stories? Well, I'm a woman, <laughs> and it really starts with that. I think um, for me, I, I'm always looking for inspiration in my own life, and I. I think we learn from telling other people's stories and we learn from watching other people's stories. And um, I think obviously with Gabby, Gabby is a, an incredibly courageous, resilient, and powerful, powerful woman. And I think um, having the opportunity to tell her story has been really in so many ways life-changing for me. Um, it really has helped me. I get up every morning and I think about Gabby and I think just keep moving forward. And uh, I complain a lot less now that I've met Gabby. And I think um, her story, obviously, is a great inspiration. And I think it's important for those stories to be told as often as possible. Thanks. And, you know, Lisa, you did a phenomenal job producing this film. Betsy and Julie did a great job directing it. But Gabby, why did you ultimately decide to cooperate? I love the film RBG. <laughs> Betsy and Julie do a wonderful job celebrating women's lives. Strong women get things done. Um, something that really comes through, I think, from the documentary, Lisa, is how um, instrumental music is to Gabby's recovery and how close it is to her sense of joy for life. Um, can, can you just sort of talk about how important um, Gabby's connection to music is to the, to the film itself? Yes, well, when we first started making the film, we didn't know about Gabby's love for music. And um, every time we would go on location, Built with her, Betsy and Julie would call me and they'd be like, she was singing again <laughs> all through the shoot. And um, it's very expensive, by the way, to clear <laughs> all of those songs. But, uh, <laughs> but, but 
it was really clear, obviously, and like you see it in the film, how important uh, music was to Gabby's recovery and really to her life. And um, it is a phenomenal soundtrack. And uh, obviously, it was really important to the film, and I think it really brings a lot of Gabby's joy out. And so it was it was a funny thing throughout the making, right? Because every time she would sing a song, we needed to find a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> but but we all we all agreed that it was absolutely worth it, and um, it really is one of those aspects of the film that I think um, brings audiences to a time in their life and and into Gabby's story. So R B G spots. Oh yes. Oh, when we first when. Um, Betsy and Julie, when they first, when we first talked about doing a film about Gabby Giffords, they were really excited and said, we've always wanted to make a film about her. And so we set up a Zoom meeting. It was during COVID, so it wasn't an ideal time we couldn't meet in person. And uh, we started the Zoom, and Gabby kicked up her foot, and she had an RB, RBG socks on. <laughs> <laughs> so Betsy and Julie were like, yes, this is so meant to be. And then uh, Gabby and Mark, Senator Mark Kelly, gave us a tour of their house. And one of the stops along the tour was the freezer with her skull. And that's when we were sure we have a film. <laughs> are, are, are the Amigo, are the, are the, is the frozen Amigo still there? Gabby? I think the Tortellini is in yes. there too, right? Um, so, so Gabby, from really an audience's perspective, um, one thing I love about this film is that you cry, but you also laugh. Um, you, you know, there's singing, there's dancing, there, there's there's so much joy in the film. But what was it like being the subject of the documentary? Amazing, amazing, amazing. Couple was hard. Masks, Zoom, no hugs. But the crew was fantastic. Speech therapy, by Rodman's stuff. Right and right, got a whole lot of singing, a whole lot of singing. <laughs> and did, did y'all catch that at the very end? There's a little clip of uh, Gabby doing her bat mitzvah, which she squeezed in um, alongside everything else that she does in her life, which is just incredible. Um, Lisa, back to you. I, you know, obviously you were immersed in this film, but then sort of watching it afterwards. Um, now it's been. A year, and South by Southwest starts uh, this weekend, so it's been a year since it premiered. Um, uh, what, 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 what did you learn from it? What surprised you about the film? Well, I mean, I think a lot of things surprised me about Gabby and um, how hard Gabby works every day to make a difference in the world. And I was really inspired to see what she's able to do. She's on a plane, I would say, almost every single day travels far more than I could. I, I would be, I wouldn't be able to speak. I'd be so tired. And all in an effort to um, change gun laws in this country and to make a difference and to save lives. And I was really, I was really moved by the effort that goes into the work that you do. And, and also really her ability to find joy, as she says, in the small things. And I, I think for me in particular, and probably for so many of us, that's such a good message and something to really remember. And it's all really true. <laughs> you know, sometimes people may exaggerate their stories, right? But with Gabby, it's all true. I remember after that Zoom, you had a Friday night cocktails at the local <laughs> bar with your friends and just finding, finding like the joy in the small things. So that, and really, the impact that she makes and the effort that goes into that is remarkable. Yeah, and you know, speaking of the impact, um, you know, something that doesn't sort of quite come through in the film is the organization that you lead. Giffords is an organization with 80 staff members, with um, three million supporters across the country. And um, you know, sometimes you feel like the filming would have been nice for it to go on just a little bit longer because if it had, it would have captured um, the triumphant passage of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which is the most significant gun safety legislation passed in the state, and is the result of so much of your hard work. Um, but 
you know, we, we, we want to, I think we'll have time for a few questions from the, from, from the audience. I don't know if there's like a mic that's, that's going around um, back there. But before we um, get to your questions, Gabby, what do you hope people will take away from your, from this story? For me, it has been really important to move ahead, to not look back. I hope others are inspired to keep moving forward no matter what. And I spent a lot of time traveling around the country with Gabby. And you cannot walk through an airport or a hotel lobby or into an office without a Scripps alumna <laughs> coming up to her and, um, um, and uh, laughing and hugging and, 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 and uh, talking about your respective experiences here. And it's obvious that you got so much from your time here at Scripps. Um, so could you share with these people who I think have gotten a lot from you and your story by watching this film and following your career. What um, you got from your experience here at Scripps? Strong woman get things done. <laughs> um, so, uh, if there are questions from the audience, I do really well with the easy ones. <laughs> And uh, my friends here will take, take the tough ones. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, aside from voting, what is one thing you want us as citizens to do? Aside from voting, what's one thing you want um, uh, you know, folks as citizens to do? Vote, vote, vote. And, and I would say, um, you know, being part of a sort of civic organization like Giffords is very important. Um, and you know, we would, there are various ways to, 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 to join us, right? You can go to Giffords.org and sign up. Um, but I'll also, uh, at the end, give the sort of text number to, to everybody so you can, you can text courage to a specific number and then we'll, we'll know you're interested and we'll be able to um, incorporate you with our efforts here in California and across the country. I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what? Chicken, chicken, chicken. Chicken, chicken, chicken. Chicken, chicken, chicken. <laughs> the, the brain. The brain. Who knew? <laughs> yes, as I was coming over here, I wanted to think about some practical ways of what we could do with gun violence and, and things of that nature. It seems like it's shifting down to the local levels. We're seeing more state uh, legislation to get involved, but it, it seems like a lot of it has to do with passing new laws. I was thinking of more practical ways of how governments all the federal, all the way down to the local level, what they're doing on a practical level to remove guns. And I was thinking about a buyback program uh, that was it seems to have been happening more in the 70s. I would assume there's a lot of COVID money floating around that hasn't been spent, and why that funds can't be used to just get back to buying back guns, get them off the streets. I'm sure people could use the money and get rid of those old guns. Any comments on that? I Absolutely. Um, I would say, first of all, that you know, passing strong laws that are going to keep hand, keep guns out of the possession of individuals who are prohibited from having them is a practical, effective, tested solution to prevent gun violence. Um, there, th that's not the only way to do it, um, though. And you know, something that is sort of an instrumental approach for preventing gun violence, in addition to putting in place the laws to restrict access and regulate firearms like the lethal consumer product that they are. Um, is to invest directly in communities. And that's one of the things that we've done right here in California. Um, over you know, our organization, working with other locally-based organizations over the past few years, have worked to appropriate $200 million to fund a program called CALVEP, the California um, Violence Intervention Program, 
that invest resources right on the ground, that understands gun violence um, through the lens of public health and epidemiology, that has the insight that violence oftentimes passes from one person to another, just like a disease. And if you have an effective program um, that can intervene in those cycles of gun violence, you can have a dramatic impact. So what we need to do to take a national tragedy, 50,000 Americans dying of gun violence every year, and to do like uh, to do what we've done to gun violence um, the, in the sort of same way that we've done with other you know, public health issues like automobile deaths, like you know, tobacco illnesses, and sort of bend the curve is um, we need to have the gun laws that are going to you know, keep guns out of the wrong hands, um, prevent them from flooding our streets, and then also have the uh, investment in communities uh, that is going to help uh, keep people out of these cycles of gun violence that oftentimes, you know, destroy lives and communities at the ground level. Um, I've just turned 16, 16, and I was wondering if you have any recommendations for some, something that I could do, because um, I can't vote. <laughs> Gabby, what do you say to the young people, to the 16-year-olds? Fight, fight, fight every day. Yeah. Keep moving forward, no matter what. Uh, it's, it's been interesting. Over the past 10 years that we've been working on this issue, the politics have be, been transformed 180 degrees. It used to be that guns was a third rail issue, that if you had said it the wrong thing, the NRA would go get you. Today, the opposite. It's true. Gun safety is a winning issue. And that is um, in large part because of the courage and the persuasiveness of young Americans speaking up. And it's not just voting, right? And, and you can look at the you can look at the data. I'm not like a political nerd, right? So I'll tell you that if you talk to a young person about guns and the chances that they're gonna vote goes up because they care. This is one of the most animating issues of their time. But you can also look at their parents, right? And um, when you look at our politics, at the quote unquote adults in the room, who too often are not acting like adults, uh, it's, it's them, it's, they are responsible for the safety of kids. When you talk about children, this is why it cuts so deep, because you're talking about a group of people who by definition are not responsible for their own safety. So when a kid is shot or traumatized by an act of gun violence, there is nobody to blame but the adults in the room. So when you know the kids stand up and they point their fingers and they call BS, that changes the way adults and politicians think. And that's why, one of the big reasons why we've been able to pass 526 different pieces of state legislation over the past decade, and like I said, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act over the summer. So thank you. Senior, um, and I want to say thank you for coming today. Um, after your shooting, how did you change the way you chose your words to continue to speak out and make an impact? It was a little, a little hard to, to, to hear, but I, I think the question was, you know, like what, what kept you moving forward after the shooting? Um, um, yoga twice a week. <laughs> French horn, Spanish lessons, ride my bike, um, the treadmill, um, you, you look really hard. Yes, yeah, really hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, something that amazes and inspires me about, about Gabby is not necessarily, you know, when she's up on a stage or when she's in front of a large group of people or when you know, the Presidential Medal of Freedom is being hung around her neck, right? It's all of the little things. It's, um, and th this always gets me, right? Um, you know, it's the thousands of hours uh, that she puts into speech therapy, just to be able to find the next word. The thousands of hours that she puts into physical therapy to be just a little bit stronger. Um, 
you, you saw, I think, the, the director made an interesting choice in the film when they, at the end, they, you see her in the gym, right? And, um, you know, and she works, she works out at this awesome gym. It's like, it's like Gabby Giffords and a bunch of Navy SEALs, right? <laughs> and you see her, she's like strapped to this harness and she's pulling a sled full of weights. But what you see in the film is the sled, you know, stacked with weights, like moving forward inch by inch by inch by inch. And that's how Gabby leads her life. And um, it's inspirational, I think, for, for me um, to see somebody put so much effort into something that I did for granted. Um, and I think that sort of you know, constant, consistent commitment to incremental progress is the reason why we're going to have a safer country ultimately. Maybe we can make this the, the last question. I know Gabby has some, some, some remarks that she'd like to share as well. Um, hi. I wanted to know, um, in the film, when you went into making the film, um, there was so much about it that, that was incredibly moving and inspiring, but something about the film that I thought was just so incredibly beautiful was the relationship between Gabby and her husband. Um, did that, in making the film, was that something that like you knew going into, or did it just unfold organically, or, because um, it was so inspiring to see, to uh, just the strength and the humor and the love um, Florence Prison. Um, so, so Gabby's referring to her first date with, with Mark, who was <laughs> literally sort of chasing her across the country, um, and he flew on like a training flight to, to Tucson, I think Gabby sort of waffled like back and forth. I've heard the story. Um, she canceled the, the, the date and then put it back on. And... Yes. Um, she was a state senator at the time, state senator at the time, um, and uh, the date, the first romantic date, was for Mark to join Gabby on a visit to the local maximum security prison. <laughs> <laughs> uh, public service has always been at the core of their relationship. But Lisa, I think it's an interesting question. Um, I've heard Betsy and Julie, the director, uh, talked about how much they loved to tell a feminist love story. Um, so, talk a little bit about uh, the the decision there, what the um, how, how the film approaches that. Well, I mean, I think we saw it from that very first Zoom because they were cracking each other up during <laughs> the house tour, and you could feel that real connection between these two people. And obviously, it's such a great storyline and it's real. It's really what happened and it's really what we capture. And there's just so many beautiful things about the relationship and about how open both of them were in letting us in to their home fully during a global pandemic and, um, and generously share their relationship the way that they did. It's amazing to watch the two of them go through what they did. And I, I think it's interesting, I say to people, they. They've both been through so much. He's gone to space. You miraculously survived. And so I think there's something about the two of them where they don't really sweat the small stuff, I like to say. So they weren't worried about us coming into their homes, which a lot of people are when you're doing a documentary. There's a lot of fear. They had zero fear. They're like, come in. <laughs> like, here's everything. And so it was really, for us, it was just um, beautiful to see the relationship and beautiful to really be allowed in in the way that we were. Absolutely. Um, so I mentioned before, if you're interested in getting involved in Giffords, um, everybody's familiar with the text, the number, right? Um, so I'll just give that to you really quick. You text courage to 34131. Again, you text courage to 34131. Or you can always go to Giffords.org and sign up. Uh, you know, we are a movement of you know millions of Americans across the country. But 
but also right here in California, we work really hard to you know, uh, change state laws. California has a gun violence rate um, roughly half the, the rest of the country. Um, it's not good enough, but it does show the power of some of the work that we've done. And like I said earlier to the gentleman's question, we've worked very hard to invest directly in the communities here who are suffering the highest rates of gun violence. So um, you're welcome to join Gabby's movement. Um, thank you so much for being here. And Gabby, um, I'll turn it over to you to offer some closing remarks. Our lives can change so quickly. Minded when I was shot. But I never gave hope. I chose to make a new start. To move ahead, to not look back. I'm relearning so many things, how to walk, how to talk, and I'm fighting to make the country safer. It can be so difficult. Losses hurt, setbacks are hard, but I tell myself, move ahead. I'm finding joy in small things, ride my bike, playing the French horn, going to the gym, laughing with friends. The small things add up. We are living in challenging times, but we are up for the challenge. My own recovery has taken years. Many, many people that have helped me along the way, and I learned so much. I learned when people care for each other and work together, progress is possible, a better world is possible, but change doesn't happen overnight, and we can't do it alone. Join me, let's move ahead together. Thank you very much, thank you.